All right. Um, I encourage everyone really to um, to start now um, to ask questions because we're um, entering into our panel discussion with the panelists that you've seen so far. Um, I encourage you all um, to uh, post your questions uh, digitally, but also uh, from the audience uh, to raise your questions. Uh, we have uh, <laughs> Joanna. In we have Joanna in, uh, in Claudio on digital, but we have uh, Patricia here on live. Patricia, please come on the stage. Um, and um, yes, um, now the stage is uh, yours to ask questions to the panelists, please. Any questions? Michael, you probably have questions. Come on. <laughs> no? <laughs> you have one. <laughs> Well, I'll give you all a little bit of time to think um, about your questions. In the meantime, uh, I'll raise one question to Patricia. First, um, others may also contribute, uh, Claudio, if you wish. Um, whereas in my early days in AI, AI, people did not know what AI was, people today definitely uh, have heard of it. Uh, and uh, use it in their everyday life. Uh, many people are even scared. Um, governments may abuse the technology for their political and military purposes. Just see how China's AI-backed surveillance systems uh, control their population, and now AI is used in driving the clash between the superpowers, just as an example. With that context uh, to you, Patricia, uh, what do you tell friends and business colleagues where AI is heading to or even taking us? Mm, well, actually every tool which is used in a wrong way can cause a harm to a people. And I think that the most popular analogy here is that you can use a hammer to fix something, but you can also use a hammer to actually hurt somebody. And yeah, these things that you said that are happening, for example, in China, I think that a few years ago it was like a still some scenario of uh, some science fiction movie for us, but now it's becoming reality and we have a right to, to feel a bit afraid of uh, where we are going. Uh, but well, China and United States are actually some uh, greater players when it comes to usage of AI, and well, Europe is quite behind of them. And it also gives us uh, some, some benefits because we can see how the AI is transforming the world and we see the challenges that uh, we are facing. And also we can react a earlier, at least in Europe. So I think that the great example is uh, those regula regulations that I was referring to during my presentation that we will have in European Euro, the law that will just ban you from doing things like social scoring, which is happening in China. We'll have then like four stages of risk and it is like unacceptable risk that that you just can't do it because you will be fined in like 30 million euros so i guess that is like a quite a hard amount of money so going back to your questions where we are going i think that we are going to a place when we will see that data is more and more powerful but actually we will uh, want to take it into a control, into our control, and we do will do much more regulations, and we will try to explain it uh, more and more to just feel safer with that. Thank you, Claudia. Do you want to add on 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 something? Otherwise, I have a question for you. <laughs> well, I pretty much agree with the last statement that was done, meaning. Uh, data is getting was more and more powerful and we see players that are actually trying to, to to compete with artificial intelligence but i strongly also believe that regulation has to evolve and we see actually that is like this and i think this is also one of the key reasons in the asymmetries in the evolution and adoption of ai across the globe as different regulation also have different impacts on uh, uh, the evolution in terms of adoption by the single players. Okay. Uh, we've, we've heard from you current uh, key use cases for, for SMEs, which uh, I think are all valid ones. Actually, the one that you presented uh, about um, the um, um, forecasting of cash flow uh, in organizations is a particular um, 
interesting for us in the factoring industry because uh, um, that would trigger actually more business coming from the SMEs. If, uh, if an um, SME owner knows uh, how uh, its cash flow is going to be in a, in a day or week or month time, if you can predict that into the future, which you can do with the AI uh, algorithmic, um, then um, the likelihood of uh, becoming uh, um, a customer in, in the factoring industry uh, would be triggered. However, in increasing VUCA times, uh, what I mean with that, global pandemics, increasing inflation rates, uh, massive migration flows to superpowers, as we, uh, as I said before, setting the scene, and last but not least, uh, a dramatic climate change. I mean, <laughs> I'm putting out a lot of stuff into here. Uh, where do you see the future contribution of AI to help SMEs in banking? Uh, uh, and why and what is the value add for both? I mean, going to your business cases, uh, the financial institutions and the SMEs. I know it's a big question, but perhaps you, you have an outlook, um, a few enlightening ideas you want to share with us. Sure thing. I think you touched a lot of points and it is exactly what is happening, meaning there are a lot of hot topics there are a lot of needs and there are a lot of answers that banks has to give to small business customers. So this is what I think it's also trying to be the role of the banks in this moment. I see like there are several drivers that will drive the evolution of AI in the, in the, in the medium term. One is definitely the monitoring of cash flows. I really think that this is something that is uh, driving the evolution of AI. Uh, this is driving also the scoring of the AI. So because monitoring cash flows, monitoring the transactions that are inflow and outflow in respect to the customer is of course used to help the customer in monitoring its cash flows. But on the other hand, is used by the bank uh, to, uh, to have a more proper score. And this is definitely one of the key directions I see banks are moving towards. The other is uh, getting hands on uh, uh, invoices from the banks, meaning the banks are getting disintermediated also by some invoicing provider that are introducing uh, also banks transactions within their offering. And this is, I think, another driver of evolution that banks are going to take into account. And the last thing I see as a as evolution that might disrupt much more than it looks like is the environmental topic. Environmental topics are actually getting really, really much more present into the both banks' uh, mindset, but also in the small business mindset. I recently saw some researchers where the small business customer would love to better understand what's the impact of their actions in respect to the climate change. One way to measure it is understanding how the spending behavior is actually affecting the environment. Because in the spending behavior, we can definitely see how gas consum consumption, electricity consumption, fuel consumption is affecting the environment. So thanks to AI, we are able to read this kind of behaviors and understand how actually I'm impacting the environment. So if banks are able to understand this, communicate it properly to a client, then I really think that this is one way that banks has to evolve into their relationship with the clients. This is why I strongly believe in this, and I also believe that banks need to play in this specific field a role in educating. Because if they can teach the, the small business customer, they then have to uh, also explain how to compensate these, uh, these, um, these emissions. Thank you, thank you, Claudio. Um, I know we have a few questions here from uh, at least uh, from the participants here in Cracovia. Um, Michael, you have a question or comment. <laughs> a question. 
Yes, I'm not sure this is this working. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, the the evolution of this kind of technology seems to be uh, moving very rapidly and accelerating uh, at an ever increasing pace. But um, banks are traditionally very slow to adopt new technology. So how do you how do you square those two aspects of this? How do you deal with that? How do you how do you get banks to perhaps move a bit faster in terms of adoption? Because this has been a very frustrating point for many technologists in the past in trying to get banks on board. Completely agree with you. And uh, um, before I say something, I would ask my panelists to maybe uh, feedback, feedback on their experience and what they are doing um, to fill the gap. Uh, Claudio, do you, wanna, do you want to follow on, on Michael's question? Uh, how do you guys sure. um, uh, fill the gap of uh, you know, providing solutions and um, the financial institutions kind of yeah, not jumping on the train? It is a fair question and uh, I think this is why also we, we have seen a dramatic uh, growth of fintechs in the last years, meaning the first enabler is, are the fintechs itself. This is why we've seen that at the very beginning of the rise of the fintech, banks thought that fintechs were actually a competitor. In the end, we have seen that fintechs are seen as an enabler for providing the technology faster to the bank. So the first enabler, I think, is definitely leveraging the fintech technologies. The second enabler is the cloud. I mean, if banks are able also to connect to external platform that are made available on the cloud, so more than deploying on-premises, once again, the technology that has been developed by a third party, I think this can definitely speed up the, 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 the technology adoption by the bank. Mm -hmm. The third thing I see is definitely leveraging again on the platform made available by third party. Because I really see this as a key enabler because, and this is I think what the open banking is teaching us is that we don't really have to rebuild everything from scratch every time. We can also leverage APIs to try to integrate third party services in our legacies, let me say. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I actually agree, strongly agree actually with the last one because uh, we also saw the gap that it's really hard to, uh, well, rebuild the, um, the whole technology in a bank and it's like the real issue and it was also one of the greatest challenges that we saw during my presentation that it's hard to actually integrate with legacy system, but also with those processes that already are in banking. So yeah, the one idea is, for example, to use to some external tools some, sometimes, which already have some functions which allows you to, to organize your data somehow and gives you like the uh, machine learning solutions inside and you don't have to do like the powerful uh, reorganization inside of uh, your financial institution. Uh, what also I would like to say about these clouds uh, that Claudio was saying, it's also a good idea to, to use a cloud, but for example in Poland there is a problem because uh, when you want to use a public cloud you actually, um, you are not allowed to move your data from Poland to another country and well now it's like that uh, all clouds have some servers also in another country and when in Poland something stops work it's move on to, to another one. So it's like illegal in Poland to use public clouds and it's a problem and I think that it will also be developed the technology of clouds and things like that that it will be more available for people for people to use uh, so um, yeah when you want to like rebuild your own strategy you want to be a really powerful player uh, with AI then think about really building your AI strategy thinking about reorganization of course it will take long because everything in banks takes long yeah uh, but uh, you have to plan it like right now to, to have the opportunity to, to be the key player in that. If you just need some several things that you know that will be important for you in your bank, then 
think about some external uh, external tools because maybe it will be just enough and it will be just easier to integrate than than to rebuild all your technological stack that you have. So what I'm hearing here, Michael, is um, um, a little bit of setting up the scene for uh, or the playground for um, the market players from maybe a regulator's point of view so that we have the chance to work. I mean, not only in a, in a particular framework uh, within a country, but at least uh, perhaps on a European basis. Um, so that would be one thing addressed to all the ones that are governmental driven in here <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and move in that direction. Uh, but I hear also another thing, and that is, um, whereas we always talk about the first mover's advantage, um, first mover's advantage, meaning the one that gotten first into, um, into migrating from state one to state two or A to B, uh, it seems that we're we're not seeing that here, Michael. Where where people don't want to be the first movers that have the advantage, because they want to see others um, <laughs> showing if there is a real advantage first. Um, I remember, um, in, in I think Daniel, you were also in, in Portugal, and you may remember when when we raised the question. Um, to the banking community, the factoring community in, in Lisbon, that, that was in 2020, a few weeks before the global lockdown uh, came, came, to, came to happen. Uh, we asked them, uh, where are you today? Where are you today in your, uh, in your um, digitalization? We're not even asking AI or blockchain uh, transformation, but we were asking, how far are you with your digitalization transformation? Um, and, um, and it was really, a, uh, maybe not a surprise, but uh, uh, we figured that 20% of the organizations were, were working on, 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 on doing a digital transformation. So um, still working way back um, and, um, and not trying to use the first user advantage and saying, well, we're looking what the Spanish do, and then if, if that works for them, then uh, we may adopt some things. Uh, it's like uh, we feel like evangelists in this industry going around for years out there <laughs> promoting, promoting the change. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Olena, please uh, feel free. <laughs> Yes, I would like to ask a question first, uh, Patricia, and maybe then Claudio. And also to comment, because, yes, we, while we were doing this common study with ASECO this year, uh, we noticed two things here in the region first, is that um, banks do not have AI strategy, and they prefer to start with the cases. And this is uh, everybody. Uh, and, and all the examples of the AI cases that we have, so everybody started with the AI cases. And here we have a circle, a problem and a challenge, let's call it like this, that um, business lines are not interested to start AI project because they don't know, they cannot measure the outcome and they do not want to allocate their business budget for the project which they cannot measure uh, in the future. And, of course, there is no a separate AI team uh, which can uh, do and have budget for this in the bank. And maybe because Patricia uh, mentioned about the AI as a service or maybe AI outsourcing. And, uh, yes, we, I encourage also to download the study at uh, ASECA uh, uh, virtual stand. And we have example there from uh, Finland, from OP Group, a bank that uh, also implemented AI. And Antti Milamaki, head of AI, shares how they uh, did this. So the, how to solve and to start these AI implementations when we do not AI people in the bank and because they don't, don't have the project to start and we don't have the project because we don't have people. Uh, so, and maybe AI as a service or AI as outsourcing can be a first start to start first cases. And Patricia, maybe you will come in how it can really technically can work for the bank in this case, because maybe this is a good start to, to, to start implementing and then understand a value for the, for the business teams. Thanks. Yes, yes, exactly. I think that uh, the opportunity that you can just check out how the AI works uh, 
just by buying some some external solution, it's a good idea because then it can give you some of assurance that actually it works, and the data is uh, at least somehow organized that you can do some use cases on that, and also you can then encourage people from those business units that it's good uh, to use it because well there is no better uh, proof of uh, that uh, AI is works than some benefits that you will just have from it. So things like buying tools from some companies, uh, IT companies, I think it's uh, good for just starting and see how it's going. And you always have an option to uh, see how it, how it looks like, but also start to build your own uh, AI unit just inside of your organization to just uh, be sure that it works and then try to build it on your own. So for example, um, you can try to take over the maintaining of the, of the model at the beginning and also uh, what I was saying during my presentation about this um, other option that you can also uh, outsource only a team. So for example, if you don't have like the experience with the whole project, you can just uh, borrow, hire a team from somewhere to do for you some machine learning project, but like inside of your technology, not like the external tool that will be added. And then it, I think, gives you um, really a lot of information what you have to change when you want to be good at an eye and, and other things. It's probably a little bit harder to achieve some successes faster when you like do everything from scratch than you buy, an, uh, than you buy a solution which is external, but it's also a, a good idea to do. And we as ASEC also uh, can provide things like consulting to, to talk with you and see what you have and, and maybe together just try to, to build something interesting. So uh, yeah, I think that outsourcing is a good idea at the beginning because also, uh, well, data scientists are like really valuable assets now and it's not so easy to find good people who, well, will make a great team and we'll be able to do some, uh, some, some great things at the beginning. So. Uh, uh, it is good to like start from from somewhere to buy something, see how it looks like, if it is, works for you or not, and and then maybe try to to be the bigger player and and build your own uh, AI units. Thank you, uh, Claudia. Do you want to um, to say I a few words on that? Agree with, uh, yeah, but very quick. I pretty much agree with Patricia. Meaning every change needs to be guided somehow. It's tough, as Olena said, it's scarce to implement something without any reference, without any benchmark. So definitely leveraging pre-existing technology, consultant, let me say, meaning expert people that can guide you in implementing the solution, leveraging an external platform, and then progressively throughout time, taking ownership can be a way and I also agree with the statement that, of course, having also good people that have proper experience is something that is, cannot be built from one day to another. So definitely, I think also leveraging uh, external consulting or external platform or both of this is definitely a key thing also for having effective results. I think it's a movement that we're seeing in many in many businesses. And actually, in, in ours, uh, FCOM, we were launching a new, um, let's call it initiative or product or service that we call factoring operation as a service. Um, out there, there are organizations that may be thinking of uh, kicking off, starting a, a new a new business, but don't have what you say all the infrastructure, all the people, every, everything set up, running and stuff. So, um, but you would like to enter that space. So how do you do that? And um, the easiest is if, if you get uh, some assistance guided, uh, outsourcing if you call it, uh, but someone that takes you, takes you uh, up and walking, I'm not saying running, uh, the first stages and then uh, up you go on yourself. So yes. Um, any other question from um, from the from the to the panelists uh, from here or digital? Otherwise, I have one more. Yes, please, Anna. Anna, is it Anna? Oh, no, it's not Anna. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so we are wondering, maybe you have uh, some um, studies on how 
implement, implementing IE in digital banking or in classic banking has uh, increased up sales or customer involvement? Okay, so I may start. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we did not do research like uh, exactly about that, that um, how in percentage is like the benefits uh, for customers. But yeah, like uh, you saw that in SME financial institutions, actually only like one third of financial institutions do something about AI. And if you go deeper into our report, you can see also there that uh, the things that people are doing are mostly connected with increasing customer experience. So with things like recommendations, with marketings and other things like that. So I think that we can assume that it's uh, the region in which we see the greatest potential for some benefits from some profitability for that. So I, we don't have like the, the, the straight uh, statistics about that, but well, I think that uh, the statement that everyone do it <laughs> can somehow like um, also say to us that it's probably a good uh, good direction to, to go to and to try also it in our company and see how it works. And what is also important to just uh, do those measure of success to set those KPIs and to like be sure when uh, something is starting to be profitable for you when you try to build such kind of solutions to just be able to track it somehow because well not everyone always goes well so so yeah, so I would uh, I would say that recommendations and things like that uh, definitely works because a lot of people actually use it, uh, but it's really important to have in mind uh, what you want to accomplish. Thank you. Claudio, do you want to expand on that? <coughs> yes. Um, we actually are developing some studies now. Uh, we'll make them public uh, in a bit, as uh, as also was explained right before me, the thing is that we need to compare things in order to say if something has improved, we definitely need to have a, a consistent period of observation. This is why I think it's also taking a bit of time for uh, all the players out there to, to, to measure it. And also because, as it was said, it's not only about improving sales, it's about improving experience. Um, and profitability. So this is something that actually I see it's uh, um, in progress. I see actually uh, in the industry, actually, I see all the players are actually trying to understand which are the right KPIs to measure, uh, how to measure them. Thank you. Um, any more and other questions, please? Yes. Maybe you want to introduce yourself yeah, uh, shortly. Thank you. Uh, Pablo Yoshevsky. And I have one question. You tackled that, that a bit already, but uh, I represent a bank, BNP Paribas, and uh, all the time I think about the AI or machine learning or, or things like that. I wonder what, in your opinion, of course, because uh, uh, I, have, I have an answer in my mind, but I'm just wondering about your opinion. What is the biggest obstacle uh, when implementing such solutions with a bank or cooperating with a bank? Yeah. Just one biggest, because we can find many, like, I don't know, uh, as you said, uh, lack of knowledge, I don't know, being scared of AI, I don't know, problems with data uh, quality or access to data or things like that. So if you were to name one biggest obstacle, what would it be? Okay, so I think that actually banks are most afraid of integration. So it's for them the key reason why they don't want to do it or are somehow resistant for implementing AI. But personally, I don't think that it's such a good, such a big obstacle nowadays because, well, when we are heading with some new technologies, we see more and more opportunities to actually overcome it somehow. So I think that nowadays, uh, things that will be the most important for us will be law regulations that will be happening because it's not so clear for us yet how it would look like. And, well, it may also uh, discourage some people from, from using a guy when, when they will see the penalty like 30 million euros, well, you will think twice before you will implement artificial intelligence of, uh, in your company. So I think that, yeah, banks think mostly about integration, but we should also start to look at those law regulations that are ahead of us because it will be probably a bigger issue for us to, to satisfy it correctly. Thank you. 
Patricia. Claudio? I see mainly two things, actually, um, in my head. One are the data. Of course, banks' assets are data. So, of course, letting someone new accessing an asset of the bank, I think it's, of course, uh, somehow a bit resistant. But I think PSD2 is pretty much changing this first mindset, I think. The second thing, of course, is getting hands on a new technology. So this implies change, but in the good sense, meaning this is something new. This is something that the bank needs to understand, needs to get hands on, and needs to understand the implication. It might imply reskilling. It might imply new regulation to be faced, as also Patricia was saying. So I think this is a bit what I think it's, it's what banks are more resistance towards to is definitely the change management in the adoption of the new technologies. Also considering that a bank is not a fintech, it's an organization. It, it, it's already, it has a structure, it guidelines. So introducing a big change, of course, has different impacts on different areas from the several business units, the compliance, the legal, to the analytics. So I see that every time we also introduce a new technology, our technology into a bank, it, it, it's affecting different areas. And of course, the banks is likely also uh, evaluating the impacts, of course, it's pragmatic of, of the new technology adoption. If I may add on that, uh, what Claudio was saying, our experience is uh, pretty much the same when we talk about transformation, because what you're doing is virtually transforming your organization and uh, and you're not transforming um, replacing machines uh, with other machines but um, you have a big impact on people and uh, since people are the ones that are driving and transforming the organization and the business leaders in, usually in a generation uh, that perhaps do not understand um, uh, the technology and the implications uh, reluctancy to change um, and um, that's why in our um, symposia that we do um, we have been inviting uh, on a regular basis pretty much over the last three four years an expert on change so we talk about technology and then we have um, an expert that tells the audience hey um, change happens in this and that way. And yes, it can hurt, but it's like at the dentist. It's going to be for a better, right? Uh, and uh, for us and for the change people, it's about making it fast and making it, uh, yeah, making it in a way that you understand what's going on. And I think the reluctance to change would be my pledge on, on this one, yeah. Looking at the time, um, I would say, um, I have one, one food for thought. I would like to uh, let you go, <laughs> at least on this panel, uh, and that is uh, considering the intro speech I gave to um, presenting um, Joanna. Um, 180 zettabytes of data. Maybe we cannot imagine what that is. Uh, that will be created and captured and uh, copied and consumed by 2025. So three times more than last year. Um, just to give you an idea, the last largest data center in the city of Frankfurt where uh, we are based and located, for example, consumes more electricity than the entire city of Frankfurt. One data center, more electricity than the entire city of Frankfurt, okay? Uh, and of course, what are they doing? Well. They're working with data. That's the only thing they do. Um, now, another one. Bitcoin alone consumes more electricity. Uh, Bitcoin alone consumes some two-thirds of Poland's electricity demand. So two-thirds of Poland's electricity demand is consumed by Bitcoin, which is one token. Mm -hmm. So this is a lot of energy. Um, the world has currently a shortage of chips. You probably have noticed it. If you wanted to buy a new car, well, you will probably not get it right away unless it's a used car. Um, and um, 
shortage of chips, automobiles, nor microwave oven can be manufactured right now because of that. Everything with a chip is on shortage right now. Data is indeed the oil of the 21st century, and we consume more and more. We should think about that as what are the consequences for all of that as well, not only what we can do with the data, but what is it implications have on another part of our life. And, what, and with that, um, I would call for a break, but before going into a break, I would also call um, the audience, if you like, to join uh, our digital booth at FCOM. Um, my colleague, uh, Georgia Tomljanovic, uh, will be receiving you there. And in the meantime, let's have a break. And we continue in five minutes, right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you, Claudio. Bye. See you. See you. Oh. <laughs>